Amen. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. You know, it's a privilege to be here tonight to, you know, share in a little word that, you know, is resting on my spirit. And it's, you know, it's a good thing, you know. I give the Lord thanks just to be here to, to share with us another time. You know, my prayer is that, um, you know, when we are through tonight, that, you know, somebody will be edified and somebody will be lifted, you know, because, you know, we're not doing anything of ourselves. We're trying to, you know, make sure that we are in the will of God. Amen. So welcome one and all, welcome one and all, and, you know, we pray God blessing upon each and every one of us. Let us just bow our heads before we even read the passage or the passages and then we see where God would lead us. Lord, we come before you this evening. We want to give you thanks for your manifold blessing. We want to thank you for all that you have done for us. We want to thank you for all that you will be doing. We want to thank you for your love and your mercy. Father God, it's another Wednesday evening, God, and we are about to break bread. We ask, mighty God, that you will feed your people, Lord Jesus. God, I'm just here as a vessel between you and your people, God. We ask, God, that you download in my spirit tonight what it is that you want your people to hear, God. We pray, Lord Jesus Christ, that the words as they go forth, that you will cause them to reach hearts, to reach spirits, and that, God, they will not return unto you void. Have it your way in this Bible study as we give you thanks right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Like I said, welcome one and all again. I greet you in the name of Jesus Christ. I would like, to, I would like us to look at two passages of scripture um, this evening. And the first one is taken from 1 Timothy chapter 4 from verses 1 through to verse 3. And then the second one will be from 2 Timothy chapter 4. And it will be from verse 1 through to verse Four. Amen. So, First Timothy 4, verses 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrine of devils. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Amen. First Timothy, let us now look at Second Timothy, chapter 4. One, two, four. I charge, so this was now in chapter 1, in, 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 in 1 Timothy 1, verse, chapter 4, you know, and if you read all through Timothy, you recognize how, how many times Paul mentioned the word doctrine within, you know, both epistles. And as he wrote to Timothy, and, you know, he, he spoke with him, I spoke to him, and he said, look here. Beware, you know, because the Spirit speak expressly, and in the latter time, many shall depart from the faith. And here now in 2 Timothy chapter 4, the apostle was now charging Timothy. He said, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be Instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. You see that is two times in this short passage that the apostle mentioned the word doctrine. You know, he said, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, 
but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Amen. Amen. So, this evening we just want to take a quick look at doctrine. You know, we want to, you know, look at the importance of doctrine as we read through the passage. We recognize that the apostle um, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, he mentioned the word doctrine. And then now in 2 Timothy, again, chapter 4, in this short passage, two times he mentioned the word doctrine. You know, it tells us then that doctrine is important, right? And we want to spend a little bit of time and we just want to look at doctrine in, you know, as the Bible speaks about doctrine. What makes a good doctrine? Um, what makes biblical doctrine biblical doctrine? Why is doctrine important? You know, these are things that we need to look at. Um, we are to be careful about what we believe and present as truth. First Timothy 4 verses 16 says, Take heed unto the doctrine continuing them for in doing this thou shalt save both thyself and them that hear thee right take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine because in doing so you shall save both yourself and them that hear you so i want us to know that doctrine is important we would not have a church without doctrine and, and doctrine is important. In the book of Acts, the Bible said they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. So, you know, as, as Christians, we must be aware that, you know, doctrine is important. And we want to just take a look at, you know, what the Bible says about doctrine. We want to look a little bit about the apostles' doctrine. We know that as a church and as a body, um, we know and we teach and we emphasize our doctrine, right? We know about um, repentance, water baptism in Jesus' name, infilling of the Holy Ghost. We know about hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. So we know about our one God and, and, and nobody can tell us anything about that. You know, I, I am not going to go in depth with all of that because, you know, we are well afraid of all of that. But, you know, I, I might just brush a little bit over it just to re-emphasize the, the doctrine, the, the, the belief that we hold as a church and why we hold that. And that is important because what we are seeing nowadays, and I don't want to jump ahead of myself, but what we are seeing nowadays is that saints are leaving the truth for that which is a lie. So, the scripture that we read earlier on, 1 Timothy 4, verses 16, it says, take heed to the doctrine. Which doctrine is it talking about? Is it any doctrine? So, you know, you just want to take a look at that to see, you know, what the Bible tells us about doctrine. And we want to look a little bit in some of the other doctrines that the Bible talks about. Because whether you believe it, yes or no, or you know it, yes or no, the Bible talks about doctrine. If you look in the book of Revelation chapter 2 and verses 20, the Bible talks about the doctrine of Jezebel. And it's important that we understand the doctrine of Je Jezebel and see how the spirit that goes with that doctrine operates. And then we, if we are able to understand the doctrine, we can be able to identify if such a spirit is in the church as we know it. And then there is what we call the doctrine of Balaam. The Bible talks about that. Jesus, when he walks the earth, you know, when he walked the earth, he talked about the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. What are these doctrines? So as we go through, we want to look at, you know, some of these scriptures and, and some of these passages and look at, you know, what the Bible really have to say about doctrine. You know, we want to look at 
the apostles' doctrine, and we want to look at some of the other doctrines that the Bible talk about. And the other doctrines that the Bible talk about, what the Bible was saying that, look here, you need to steer away from these. You see, doctrine is a serious thing, you know. It is a serious thing. And when we look at what the apostles say, the apostles said, in Galatians, he said, though we are an angel, preach any other gospel unto you, let him be a curse. And he repeated the same saying a second time for emphasis. It means, therefore, as children of God, we must understand the importance of doctrine and we must know what we believe in. So, you know, I hope that as we get into this topic of doctrine, you know, we will be edified as individuals. We will be um, firmly grounded, you know, because sometimes, you know, it just takes us listening to one person. And just listening to that one person, it might rock you a little bit because we are not so certain of the doctrine. Or we are not so certain of what we embrace as individuals. So when we look around us within the church arena, many things are happening. We have false teachers on the rise. We have false preachers on the rise. And while this is not just happening now, we must recognize that no more than ever, we have seen an increase in persons who say that they are serving and worshiping God, but they are leading folks to a devil's hell. I want us to understand that the devil, Satan himself, is, is much smarter than, than we are. And gone are the days when the church started, he persecuted the church. And the more we persecute the church, is the more the gospel spread. What he's doing now and his tactics that he's doing now, right? He's not persecuting. But what he's doing now is having people preaching and teaching as if they are preaching the truth and teaching the truth and seems as if they are working miracles. But in, in, in essence, they are leading souls to hell. So we have seen a rise, we have seen an increase in, 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 in preachers and teachers and, and, and false prophets. A pop people, everybody now is an apostle. Everywhere you turn, there is an apostle. If somebody just gets saved, give him two months and he's an apostle. Give him two months and his prophet so and so. But I have not so learned Christ. I remember the Bible says that, that the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul had an experience with Christ. He was going to persecute the church and God smote him off his house. And on his knees, God talked to him and said, Saul, Saul, why doest thou kick against the prick? And he said, who art thou? And he said, I am Jesus who thou persecuted. And Paul had an experience with the Lord. No, after Paul received his sight, he went to study three years in the desert. And then he came and he confirmed what the Lord gave him with what the other apostles had. So how is it? And that is what I'm saying. I'm, I, I don't learn Christ that way. How is it that somebody just gets saved? Don't understand the word and give him two months. And he's apostle and he's prophet and he's teacher this. And, and, and I have not so learned Christ. The Bible, line upon line and precepts upon precept. And that is why it is important that we look a little bit at doctrine and find out some of the things that the Bible said, so that we can be better guided as 
individuals. So we have seen an increase in this time of, you know, everybody is, 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 is just doing their thing. And one of the things, the coronavirus, is another thing that we must look at. One of the things that this pandemic is doing is to destabilize the saints of the Most High God. Pastors have spent years preaching, teaching from the Bible, and all of a sudden, we can't have church anymore. Yes, we're trying to do something online, but it's not the same. We, we look at our church. We had a prayer meeting on Wednesday with Bible study. Monday night or Tuesday night, you might have some form of auxiliary meeting. So you're at church. You're gathering together. Then Friday night, you have a youth service. Saturday, some of the youths come together and they play football. We're talking about gathering and coming together. Then now you have on a Sunday morning, we gather into Sunday school. Then Sunday morning worship. Then Sunday night worship. So as a child of God, you would find that you spend a whole lot of time in church. Bible says, iron sharpen it, iron. But now, we get less time together. Let us look at the Bible, um, what it says in Hebrews 10, verses 25. So we get less time together. We used to come to Bible study come to prayer meeting, come to auxiliary meeting, go to youth service, Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday morning worship, Sunday night worship. So even if there is a little bit distraction, you kind of have something that forces you to come out to church. And when you come to church now, listen to what the Bible says here. Hebrews 10 verses 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. And this is what the coronavirus is doing, you know. It is causing us not to be able to gather together. As the same manner of some is. But exhorting one another. You see, when we come to church and come together, I can't just be passing you and God just give me a word in my spirit, you know. And we just say, look here, sister or brother, you know, the Lord just give me a word for you. And we tell you. But you see, when you're not gathering together, how is it that you are going to exhort each other? Unless we have the telephone number that we can talk to each other. But this virus, this pandemic, it is working against the church. And as Christians, we need to wake up and realize what is happening. So it is easy when we come together. Don't forsake the assembling of the brethren. And we come together and we get a word. Oh God, and we get a word and we give our brother. It's easy when we can greet each other. And, and the Bible says greet each other with a holy kiss. In our culture, we don't really greet with kiss. But we greet with a little hug up and we greet with a shake. And no, we have to be social distancing. Can you imagine when we had... And when we were able to greet folks, and folks said, look here, based on how they were greeted, they never felt such love. And no persons come to church, and they just wave their hand, and we say, God bless you. That kind of thing that, that makes it what we want, because we are social beings, is just not there. And we have to pay attention to what this coronavirus is doing. Also, while we have a drive to have service online because this is what the, the, the virus has caused us to do and then what the government implement now, we are not able to have services under the 
the tabernacle. But we are able to now have services online. What is happening now is that you have preachers from everywhere. You have teachers from everywhere. You have prophets and apostles, and you can name them, from everywhere that is having services online. And if we are not careful, we will sit and we will absorb and, and listen to some of these speakers. And before you know it, you are caught believing a lie. You are caught turning your back on God. You are caught disrespecting the leaders that God established to watch over your soul. Because we sit and we listen. So the years that your bishop, your pastor spent molding and nurturing. Do you know that just by sitting for five minutes and listening something can, can contaminate everything that your, 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 your ministers try to, to, to instill in you? Just by five minutes of listening to somebody that calls himself apostle, that calls himself prophet, And when we look at what is happening, our souls are being destroyed. There is a burden in my spirit, you know, for souls. I want those who know the name of Jesus, those who are called by the name of Jesus, to remain saved. You know, it is a hard task to, to keep those who are saved, saved. Persons have got to be determined in this time. To remain safe. There's a burden, like I say. Because persons are not adhering to sound doctrine anymore. But are being led astray. And has become worshippers of Satan. You might be saying... Brother Bailey, what do you mean by being a worshiper of Satan? I am not worshiping Satan. Worshiping Satan don't necessarily mean that you're going to take a hoat and swear allegiance to him. But what it means is that if you are not walking in the principles and the status of the Lord... Because if it's not God, it must be the devil. And we, one of the way to the soul is the things that come within our hearing. And when that thing comes within our hearing, it resides, uh, it, it resides in our souls. And when it resides in our soul, one of the things that happen, it can either bring our soul to a place that is closer to God, or it can corrupt our souls. And when we sit and we listen to certain folks, and I am not telling us who to listen to. Because God has given us the spirit where we, we can discern. God has given us the word where we, we can understand that he that confesses that Christ has come in the flesh is the true son of God. So we know how to decipher. So as individuals, as a church, we can't allow folks and we can't just sit and just listen to anything because I rather, let me tell you this, I rather to, to be in church and to see one of our young people, one of our young persons come up and give a word as exhortation. I don't have to go listen to any big preacher. Yeah, some of these folks, they come and, 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 and it's about getting the letter right. It's about pronunciating the words right. It is about, and, and I'm not saying that all of that is not important, you know. 
But there is no anointing. There is no directive to tell somebody, say, look here, this is how you, this is the way to salvation. You listen to some folks. You never hear them one time yet. Say, look here, you need to repent and get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. That is what we are called to preach. So I am saying that what is happening now in the church arena, and I'm spending some time, you know, just taking my time. What is happening in the church arena, we must be aware of it. False teachers right around, and the Bible warn us of that. And the Bible also warns us that in the last days, that many shall depart on the faith, from the faith, and giving heed to the spirits, seducing spirits. And doctrine of demons. Don't want to run ahead of myself. Just taking my time. Another thing that we must be aware of. What is happening in this time. Is that. There is a call within the Christian fraternity. Or the Christian arena. For unity. And this is not anything new. We know about this. But there is a call. For unity. While we welcome unity, let us look at Psalms 133 verses 1. While we welcome unity in the body of Christ and we try to maintain the unity because the Bible tells us Behold how good and how pleasant it is For brethren to dwell together in unity. How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. So while we welcome, yes we welcome unity in the church. It is also important to know what we believe in. So this call that I'm talking about that there is in Christendom, it is not the call to say, look here, unity among the brethren. But this call that I'm talking about is that Roman Catholic, Anglican, Pentecostals, Apostolics, Evangelical, Charismatic, Baptists, you name the different denominations. And this is what they are saying. In other words, they are saying, look here, put aside doctrine. Though we are an angel, preach any other gospel to you. Because if you understand the gospel, you will know that the gospel is really a part of the overall doctrine that we embrace as Christians. So what they are saying now is that put away the doctrine. The Apostle Paul said two times in Galatians for emphasis. What was taught to you, in other words, you know, this is what they are saying. What was taught to you by your forefathers? What was taught to you by your elders and your bishop who love the Lord and uphold holiness and uphold righteousness? Put away that which was taught. And let us come together as God's children. Put away what was taught to you by the apostles. We have more in common than what separates us. We all believe in Jesus Christ. Sound like something that Satan would say. No? We, say we all believe in Jesus Christ. We sing the same songs. We read from the same Bible. We go to the same seminary for training. We have more in common than what separates us. Let us put away the differences and unite our efforts for world peace. Look here, church. We are in serious times. In 2022, 
don't have it here in my notes. In 2022, they will launch, as a matter of fact, they are presently building the temples right now. And in 2022, they will launch Chris Lamb. So slowly and slowly and surely what they are doing is taking away. The Pope visited in the Middle East. And when the Pope left, they start building this temple. So Christians, Jews, Arabs are going to be going to the one place to worship. What is happening now? This apostles doctrine, this doctrine that was left to us by our founders, they are telling us that we need to come together and, 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 and forget about your doctrine. Let us just come, forget about the things that separate us because the things that separate us are are minute. We have more together and more in common than what is separating us. And as a church, we have got to be vigilant. We have got to be aware of what is happening because, and we have got to hold on to what has been taught to us. It's important then that we know what we believe and why we believe it as Christi as christians we often believe things because they are taught to us and majority of those who come to church will hear the word presented and believe it And, and that is understandable because when I got saved, I heard the word. And I believe. But I didn't stop there because I wanted to know, and this is very important. I wanted to know if what I was involving is the truth. So you must know why you believe what you believe. So as Christians, like I say, we tend to believe the things that are taught to us. And sometimes we don't ask questions. It could be from our local pastor, a local bishop. It could be from just a teacher. But the things are taught to us. And we accept what is taught to us. Could be teaching from a denomination. And we teach people about the oneness and baptism in Jesus' name. And, and we indoctrinate people. We hear it taught and accept it as truth. I never really take the time to understand the issue and to know why we believe what we believe. We hear it taught and accept it as truth and never really take the time to understand the issue and to know why we believe what we believe. There are so many varied beliefs on many topics in church. It is important for us to be willing to look at these issues for ourselves so that we can have a better understanding of why we believe what we believe. The Bible in 2 Timothy 2 verses 15 It's important, saints of God, even after I 
go through what I'm going through this evening. I am telling you, don't take my words for it. Take your time out. Go to the Bible and see what the Bible says. See if what I am telling you is what the Bible says. Talk to God and get an understanding for yourself. You need to be persuaded why you believe what you believe. If somebody comes to you and asks you the question, why is it that you believe what you believe? Why is it that you go to that church? Why is it that you are baptized in Jesus' name? Why is it that you believe that somebody is not saved if, if they don't receive the Holy Ghost? What would your answer be? Are you able to give a reason why you believe what you believe? The Bible in 2 Timothy 2 verses 15, it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God. It says, A workman that needed not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Study it a lot of time. What befalls us as Christians is that we do not study the word of God. We do not study the word of God. But what we do, we take the word of God. I, 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 somebody teaches us and we take what they teach. Somebody preaches to us and we hold on. And I'm not saying that we must hold on, you know. But how is it that we are going to know if what the person is saying is truth? So we need to study the word of God so that we can give an answer. Saints are not studying the word, and I am not saying that you have to go to a Bible school. I am not saying, I'm saying that, look here, if a scripture is mentioned and you, you don't understand the scripture, you don't understand the principle that govern the scripture, what is it that you need to do? You need to ask somebody. You need to do a little research. We are in a, the age of technology and the age of information. So everybody have a smartphone. Chances are you're in Wi-Fi range all of the day. It can't be that we are on WhatsApp and we are on social media and we have a scripture that is in our spirit and we don't spend some time to try to understand what the scripture is saying to us. So because of we not studying now, the Bible tells us also that we will be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Sometimes some people in church and they look like they, they look like a tower in church, you know, and they seem like a tower. But just a little blow of a certain kind of doctrine, blow past and see what happened. They run, they blow gone with it. And I am saying to us as children of God, I am saying to us who are looking to make it into the rapture, that if ever a time that we need to stand up, it is now. It's ever a time that we need to know the word of God, know what is being said to us, then it is now. So because we don't know, we believe anything. And we are tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. The apostle Peter, he admonishes the people that he wrote to in 1 Peter 3, verses 15 and 16. But sanctify the Lord your God in your hearts. And what? Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks it. You are reason of the hope that is it in you. With meekness and fear. Having a good conscience that where as they speak evil of you, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely, falsely accuse your good conversation with Christ. So, so, so if we look at the passage, you know, Paul is not just saying that by our mouth we must be able to give an a, 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 a answer to every man, but by our lifestyle. Having a good conscience, 
We are off. They speak evil of you. As evil do as they might be ashamed that falsely accuse you. And that is just by your lifestyle. Oh God, if you believe it, you're going to live it. Hallelujah. If you believe it, you're going to live it. If you don't believe it, you're not going to live it. And that is why some of the folks that are in church, tell me why is it? I like me. Bishop not, Bishop not really have any trouble with me. Yes. You know, me not really get trouble as I see it. But why is it that as preachers and teachers, right, you have to keep on preaching about certain things? And it is not new converts you're preaching to. These things about, you know, it's persons in church that should be seasoned. But because we are in church for years and we are not convinced about what we believe in. We don't know the reason why we believe what we believe. And as people of God, we are at the point where we must believe. And is able to give a reason why we are in what we are in. Not just by what we say, but by our lifestyle. Our lifestyle should testify to men the reason why we are doing what we are doing. So the apostle said, if we are asked, it tells us that we are dear might come a time when we are asked why we do what we do, why we go to church, why we worship the Lord. If you are asked what you believe, what would you say? We should be able to give an answer. Are you convinced that what you believe is the truth? Are you convinced that what you are in right now, are you convinced that that is the truth? That is a question that I need you to answer. And you need to know this, if you are not convinced, try and be convinced. Because if you are not convinced, sooner or later, you will be blown away with a new doctrine that comes along. I have been in church, yes, a good look a while. I've seen persons come to church, come into church for years. I come to church and I see some people. And, and one of the times they were saying that if the name, you say baptize in Jesus' name, or you must say baptize in the name of Jesus Christ. And I say people leave out of church because... They must say, we don't baptize and say, in the, in, in the name of Jesus Christ. I have been in church for years, and I have seen people leave out of church because woman must not preach. Woman must not teach. Can you imagine? Just some fam so you might see some folks in church, but they are not completely convinced of what they are involving. Are you convinced tonight? Are you convinced tonight of what you are involving? The, 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 
Bible in the book of Luke. Luke wrote to a man called Theophilus. Theophilus was a friend of Luke and Theophilus wanted to know, he wanted to be convinced of what he was involved in. And Luke wrote to him and tell him all the things that happened with Jesus and all the things that Jesus did. And then in the book of Acts, because Acts was written to, to Theophilus too, you know. And in the book of Acts, they, 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 Luke wrote again and tell him the other things that happened. Tell him all about baptism. Tell him about infilling of the Holy Ghost. Tell him about the power of God. So what Luke did was to, 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 to talk to Theophilus to get him at the point where he can be completely convinced that what he was involving is the truth because Theophilus was searching and he wanted to know that what he was involving is the truth. Are you convinced? I ask it another time. Are you convinced that what you are in is the truth? If you are not convinced, I am telling you that another doctrine, another wind of doctrine is going to blow and you are going to be moved out of your place. Hallelujah. And when you are moved out of your place, it is going to be hard for you to come back into that place. I say all of this, all of this, I say all of that, that you have the, the coronavirus to contend with. You have the, the call for everything in Christendom to come together. You have the, the call for persons to be convinced of what they are involved in. I say all of that. To say that doctrine is important. Anything other than the doctrine of the apostles. Is a lie. And sometimes it might look like. But it is not. And I say all of that so that we can be careful not to find ourselves in hell. That is the main thing. Careful not to find ourselves in hell because if it is not the apostles' doctrine, if it's not what the Bible teaches, if it's not what the Bible put forward to us, then you're going to find yourself in trouble. And a lot of folks nowadays have it itching ears. And, and because the preacher is telling you that you can do certain things, and because he's telling you that you can wear certain things, that is the type of preacher you want to hear. But when preachers come to talk about holiness and righteousness and living by the principles and the commandment of the Lord, people don't want to hear that. But you want something that line up with your conscience, not what the Holy Ghost and not what God is preaching you about. But you want something that will line up with your conscience and your belief. Not so with God. That is why he enrobed himself in flesh, come this earth and walk and teach men, taught men, and have man to understand his requirements. And these men afterwards preach and teach and wrote epistles so that we can use it as people of God to guide our way of living. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. First Timothy 4, 1 to 3. So these are the passages that we start reading. And I'll give you all of that introduction, you know, so that we can get down now into, you know, what the scripture is saying and what the scripture is talking about doctrine. And if you go through the book of Timothy, first and second Timothy, you will read the amount of time the apostle talked about doctrine to Timothy. Doctrine, church, 
is important. Don't let anybody tell you that you, the doctrine is not important. Doctrine forms a part of our belief system. 1 Timothy 4, 1 to 3. So, the two passages that we read, both main mention of doctrine. The apostle talked to Timothy, 1 Timothy 4, 1 to 3. He said, no, the Spirit speaks expressly. Capital S there. So it's not the spirit of man, but it's the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. Speak expressly, speak, though it might not be in similar words, but it is written, and you can look at Mark chapter 13, verses 22. But the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. Why? Because they will give heed to seducing spirits. Oh God, and doctrine of devils. So, when the apostle said the spirit speaks expressly, if you look in the book of Mark, chapter 13, 22, Christ said it himself for a false Christ and false prophets. Don't in the introduction, that is what I was saying to you. Jesus, when he wore the earth, said it. False Christ and false prophets shall rise and shall show signs. And a lot of people like to see the signs, you know. Like to see the signs and say, look here, if, sign, if, if this man is able to heal, dear, so is where I want to go. And wonders to seduce if it were possible, even the very, uh, Jesus said this, you know, even the very elect would be deceived. So the apostle now in the New Testament was saying now that the Spirit speaks. And what Jesus said was what the apostle Paul was saying. No, the Spirit speaks expressly that in latter times some shall depart from the field. I want us to know that some are departing from the field. Even now, because they are giving heed to seducing spirits, these spirits will seduce and, and, and these doctrines from Satan himself. It, it, it might look like it, this is it, but it is not it. You are not going to know that that is a devil that is preaching. You think Satan going to come and, and, and come? The Bible says that he transformed himself as an angel of light. So you look upon the man out there and him preaching and doing something like miracles, but it's not miracle. Because a kingdom now cannot fight against itself. So it might look like a miracle, but it's not a miracle. But it's a way to captivate individuals. Because Jesus said, you know, a whole lot of people looking for sign. So once somebody see a man stand up out of a wheelchair, Probably him can't stand up a long time, but him just come in at the, in at the tent, in at the convocation, in a wheelchair. Nobody don't know him from Adam. And him come in at the convocation with a wheelchair and the preacher lift him up. When it was something that was planned. I'm just saying. Right? So you are not going to know that it is a devil 
that is preaching, you are not going to know that it is a devil that is teaching. Because you are going to come as an angel of light. It is only by knowing the word of God that you are going to differentiate if it is from hell or if it is of God. Only by knowing the word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. We're talking about doctrine. So you will not know. And you will sit and you will listen and you get to love this preacher. And then you love this teacher and everything that he says. My God, I was raking the yard the other day. And I was listening to somebody playing something. A teacher was teaching, an apostle was teaching. Mighty God. And I'm saying that some of the things that he was saying is not biblical. But if you don't know the word, you are going to have an issue. No, the Spirit speak it expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrine of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with an, an iron. Speaking lies, having a conscience. Remember now, you know, when we get the Holy Ghost, our conscience now becomes alive because the conscience now becomes alive to the Holy Spirit. That is how the Holy Spirit guide us and lead us. So when the conscience is seared, it is not lively again to the Holy Spirit. Second Timothy 4. One, two, say, I charge you. I charge you, therefore, before God. And the Lord Jesus Christ, whom shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and kingdom. What he was saying to Timothy, you know, he said, I charge you, you know, because if you don't do it, you know, this same God that shall judge the quick and the dead will judge you at his appearance if you fail to preach the word. So he said, preach it, be it instant, in season. Now look here, the word of God don't have a season, you know. But what he was saying, in case you think that there is not a season, Preach it. And if there's a season, so he was saying that at all times, you're supposed to preach the word. And you what I'm saying, no, you must do with the word. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. That is why we tell us you have to know the word. If you know the word, you will know sound doctrine, you will know sound teaching. For the time, and this is why him tell Timothy, you know, him say, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own loss, they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall turn unto fables. Do you know, child of God, do you know that the good that you would, many times you do not, and that which you would not, that you do? Do you know that even on your very mountain top you can find yourself in sin you can find yourself falling
So it is important that we know the word and we hold on to sound doctrine. So really doctrine is important. If the apostle spends the apostles spend so much time talking about doctrine, Jesus spoke about doctrine. Even in the book of Revelation, it talks about doctrine. It means, therefore, then that doctrine is important. So what is doctrine? What is doctrine? The word that translates doctrine means instructions, especially as it applies to lifestyle application. In other words, doctrine is teaching imparted by an authoritative source. No, it depends on who you consider the authoritative source. In our church, the, 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 the bishop, the pastor, the leaders can be considered as, as authoritative source. So it's really teaching imparted by an authoritative source. No, when you take time out for yourself and you look at the word, now, if you are listening to a person preaching and teaching for years, and then now you take time out most of the time, look at what the person is saying, line it up with the word, and you realize that, look here, what he's saying, you know, man, is so it comes from the Bible. Then chances are after a time you can take what he says because you know the principle that governs the, the, the individual life. So it depends on who you consider as authoritative. In the Bible, the word doctrine always refers to spiritually related field of study. Right? The Bible says of itself that the word is profitable for what? Doctrine, and that is found in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. The word is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So we are to be careful then about what we believe and present as truth. 1 Timothy 4, verses 16. We read it already, but let us read it another time. It says, take heed. 1 Timothy 4, verses 16. It says, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing so, in doing this, thou shalt save both thyself, thyself and them that hear thee. So there can be true and false doctrine. Guess we would have come to that conclusion based on what was said earlier on. But there can be true and false doctrine. The word doctrine can be referred to, referred to the biblical teachings. Teachings that come from the Bible and are aligned with the teachings of Christ. They are aligned with the teaching of the apostle. This is what I consider to be true doctrine. It comes from the Bible. comes from the word of God. It can be backed up by scripture. By two or three witnesses, it can be backed up by that. But false doctrine, in the case of 1 Timothy 4 verse 1, are the ungodly teachings of Satan. Those who follow the doctrines of demons and seducing spirits will fall away from grace. That is, those who take heed in the doctrine of demons is a serious matter because it involves a departure from the gospel of Christ. The Bible says that we can't serve two masters. So you're going to hate one and you're going to love the other. So if 
somebody is giving heed now to seducing spirits and to doctrine of demons, automatically is going to leave, turn his back, stop following the truth. Like I said, the teaching of these demons are so luring, are so appealing, that before you come to your spiritual sense, you're swept away. The song says, what your eyes, what your eyes, what they see, don't see it. But what your ears, what your ears, what they hear, don't hear. Or don't listen. Because, I said it earlier on, if you spend five minutes and listen to certain things, it can so much corrupt your spirit. It can so much corrupt your spirit that what your bishop and your leader spend years trying to cultivate becomes totally destroyed just for listening to something for five minutes. Like I said, these false prophets and teachers and apostles, false, you cannot look upon them and know. But you can know if they are talking the truth, if you know the word of God. When can a doctrine, so when can a doctrine be considered to be truly biblical? A doctrine can only be considered truly biblical when it explicitly, when it is explicitly taught in the Bible. So, there are different issues. An issue could be unbiblical. Unbiblical means it, it is opposed to the teaching of the Bible. It can be extra biblical, outside or not mentioned in the Bible. It can be biblically based, meaning that it connects to the teaching of the Bible, or it can be biblical. So when you have issues, issues in life, issues in how we live, it can fall in one of these categories can be unbiblical, it can be extra-biblical, it can be biblical-based, or it can be biblical. So what, when can a doctrine be truly biblical? An unbiblical doctrine is any teaching that stands opposed to the clear teaching of the Bible. So, going forward from here on now, we can understand what or when somebody says something and it is unbiblical. Can't be good for a doctrine. It is unbiblical, meaning that the teachings stand opposed to clear teaching of the Bible. For example, I believe that Jesus sinned is unbiblical. It stands in direct contrast of what the Bible teaches. And it teaches so in many places. Hebrews 4 verses 15. People will ask the question, how is it that Jesus was a man and, and, and he was without sin? And people don't want to make that in a doctrine. But the Bible says, because if we're going from the Bible, you know, if we're going from our Christian world view, the Bible says, we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we were, yet he did not sin. We have one who has, not, who has been tempted in every way. But yet without sin. 
Or, some might say Jesus did not rose from the dead. But the Bible clearly teaches us that he rose from the dead. So, it is unbiblical because the Bible does not support it. And it contradicts everything that the Bible teaches. In Mark 16, verses 16, 16, verses 6, But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. He seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they lay him. So if somebody said, that look here, Jesus did not rose. That is unbiblical. It's, it's in the Bible. We can also look at Luke 24, 6 and 7. He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men. And be crucified. And the third day rise again. So we get the unbiblical. It is not mentioned in scripture. It is opposing to what the Bible says. And that is what we can't see. That um, it's an unbiblical doctrine. Then there is what we call extra biblical doctrine extra biblical doctrine would be anything or any teaching that is not directly taught in the bible it can either be good or bad so it's extra biblical doctrine it is something that is not directly taught in the bible it can be either good or bad. For example, when it comes to voting, some denomination teaches that you should not vote because voting is wrong and voting is sin. Then there is some that teaches that you can vote because it is your democratic right to, 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 to give you know, an impact in who runs the country. Right? So some folks will say that, look here, don't vote. Voting is wrong. And some folks will say, look here, it is your right. But the Bible don't teach us and say, look here, vote or don't vote. So it is what we call extra biblical. You know, the Bible don't directly teach about the thing. Right? On the other hand, so we say that there are some that will teach and some that will not teach. Then now we have biblical based doctrine and this is other teaching that can be based on biblical principles now i want to make a little point here because sometimes you know we are saying that look here this thing is not in the bible but not because it is not in the bible means that we can do it Because if the Holy Ghost guide our conscience and the Holy Ghost convict us and say don't do it, then we have got to answer too. But then there are other biblical based principles. So these are things that we should live by. For example, the Bible don't say to us, say, look here, don't smoke. Let us look at 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20. The Bible don't say to us, um, don't smoke. But as Christians, we know that smoking is wrong. First Corinthians 6. So, so while the Bible don't tell us, don't smoke. We can look at the passage, and this is what we call you know, biblically based doctrine. So we can look at what the, the, the Bible and is able to say, look here, based upon this scripture, we should not do this. 
what 1 Corinthians 6 verses 19 says. It says, your, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which he have of God, and ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So in other words, what the Bible is saying to us, that while it don't say, don't smoke a spliff, don't smoke a cigarette, what the Bible is saying is that your body is the temple of God. And if your smoke is destroyed, you're going to destroy the body. If your heat unhealthy is destroyed, you're destroying the body. But as it pertains to smoking, while the Bible don't say don't smoke, because you are bought with a price, the Bible says glorify God in your body. If you smoke, you're not glorifying God in your body. And in your spirit, which belongs to God. So that is what we call biblical base. So though the scripture, the scripture don't speak and say, and say, don't smoke. But there are scriptures here and principles in scripture that we can use to say, look here, smoking is wrong because your body is the temple of the Lord. And then there is what we call biblical doctrine. And biblical doctrines are teachings. Because we say doctrine is really teaching, right? Um, it is teaching that are expressed explicitly taught in the Bible. For example, if we look at Genesis 1 verse 1, when we talk about the creation, the Bible says it is God that created the heaven and the earth. But we have a whole lot of folks is saying that, look here, somebody can just speak and the world created like that. Something must happen. And some other folks are saying that, look here, it is out of an explosion that the heaven and earth was formed. Even if it is out of an explosion that the world was formed, it is still God that says, and the Bible said this, from our Christian worldview, this is how we view the world, this is how we view things. If the Bible says so, I so it go. Because we believe in the word of God. Remember now we read 1 Timothy 3 verse 6. The word of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction. And if the doctrine say it is God that created the world, it is God that do it. So, some folks are even troubled in their mind and spirit because they say, look here. Something challenge word of God and they're not so sure. If, if you have a worldview and a worldview from the Bible, look here, from the Bible state, I saw it go. What about the sinfulness of people? Because how is it, you know, and they are saying that how is it that, 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 that because of one man? The Bible said that because of one man's sin entered the world. Romans chapter 3. He said, the waging of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. He said, all of sin and fall short of the glory. Is the Bible say it? Hallelujah. So some folks will say, look here. How you mean by all sin? Because me, me not do nothing sinful. But the Bible said that, look here, we're born with a sinful nature. So it is biblical based. When we talk about biblical doctrine, it is biblically based. When the Bible talks about the virgin birth, is that the Bible say? I believe it. This is my worldview. So anybody who have something to say that look here, virgin can't have baby, it is in the Bible. And look here, I just feel it to say it. Because you know sometimes people question everything and they talk everything. But how is it that somebody that was so sinful get the Holy Ghost? 
You don't know nothing about the next language. And you're able to talk in tongues as the Spirit of God gives utterance. The Bible said it. And if the Bible said it and it happened, then anything else the Bible said, we can go with it too. Just my reasoning. So the Bible talks about now, listen now, the resurrection. Oh God. How is it that people are saying, right? And look at 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 11. When, 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 when the Bible talks about resurrection, how is it that people are supposed to say, when you're dead, you're dead and you're not come back? And people say, look here, burn me, spread me ashes all over under the sea because you're going to have a rude awakening. And, and when people do that, and I say, look here, no resurrection, and even if resurrection come, God can't put the sun together. You have a rude awakening. Because if God was able to say, let there be and there was, what are, who are you, the sun, to say, look here, farm back who you were before, and then him give you the judgment. So what, what I'm saying here is that, the biblical doctrine, we, if we get a doctrine and we say it's biblical, it must be Bible based. So just one more point. If the Bible says that you can't do nothing, Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9. But if the Bible says that you can't do anything to save yourself, what is it that you are going to try? How is it that people are saying and they are telling you something that is unbiblical? That the good works that you do can save you. For by grace, the Bible says, Ephesians 2 verses 8. It says, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. So I want us to know that when we talk about biblical doctrine, it must come from the Bible. It must line up with the Bible. It must line up with the principles and the status of God. When we talk about the character of God and we mention about doctrine, the doctrine must line up back with the character of God. So if you hear now people talking things and it can't line up with the Bible, it can't be biblical. And we can't be drawn away by people saying things and it's not biblical. As children of God, we have got to come to the point and come to the understanding where we know that doctrine is real and doctrine is important and the apostles made emphasis on it and if we are going to make it in to the kingdom of God we have got to hold to sound doctrine oh glory to God we have got to hold on to doctrine the Bible says Galatians Though we are an angel, preach any other gospel unto you, let him be a curse. And he repeated it a second time. Though we are an angel, preach any other gospel unto you, let him be a curse. So it's important then that we understand that this doctrine, the apostle doctrine, the, the doctrine that we embrace, the, um, the doctrine that we hold on to, it's important that we understand that we don't let it go for anything at all. While the new wind of doctrine blowing, you just hold on to, 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 to what you have, hold on to what God gives you. Duck if you have to duck and make the, the breeze blow past. But hold on to repentance. Hold on to water baptism in the name of Jesus. 
Hold on to infilling of the Holy Ghost. Hold on to holiness. Hold on to one God. Make everything else blow. Because this is what we believe in. We have much more to say. But, you know, I want to just rest right here for tonight. And then next week we can continue. But, you know, doctrine, I mean, is just so important. And, and we're going to get down in it. We're going to just brush over a little, a little bit over the, 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 the repentance. And, you know, because there are some things in repentance, I believe that, you know, there are some things in repentance that persons must know, you know. And we don't, we're not going to touch everything in repentance. But, but something like restitution. Because some people don't understand how important restitution is as it pertains to repentance. And I have seen an individual for years don't get the Holy Ghost. And God give me a word. Remember now, you, know, you see it? We said, don't forsake the assembling of the bridge. And God gave me a word. I'm going to go to the person and say, look here. The Lord says restitution and the problem, you know. And I might tell you that story. And he just work the person to get the Holy Ghost. I mean, I said, God. So, so there are just some simple things we, we're going to touch over. And touch over some simple things in baptism. Because, you know, some folks are saying that, look here. If we sprinkle water upon you, you're baptized. It is not biblical. So how is it that we we, 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 we listening to those things? The doctrine, the doctrine of sprinkling, it's, it's unbiblical. The Bible says that, that, that they went to Anon to baptize because there was much water. But we know all of them something here. But we're going to just brush over a little bit of thing and just polish it up so that we know that, look here, with all everything that is blowing, with us, with us, with us. I remember Bishop Grizzly used to say, you know, this guitar man, so when all the other people were moving up the key, he was just on his one string. And they said, look here. Oh, you're not moving him. So look here. I find it, man. But you're looking for it. I found the thing, man. This apostle's doctrine. So when people being blown away and move away, I find the thing. I don't have to listen to anybody who have, who have a whole heap of followers. I'd rather to listen to somebody that you know, is, is of our congregation, even one of the youngsters, and, and that alone will minister to my soul. But look here, the doctrine, hold on to what you have. Hold on to the apostles' doctrine. God bless you tonight. Thank you for tuning in. So God willing, next week, you know, we can continue with this doctrine, um, study on the doctrine, and we will continue to look at, you know, what makes that doctrine and you know, the important, we don't even touch the importance of doctrine yet, right? So we just want to look at some of these things and, you know, we just wish that God bless you in Jesus' name. Just bow your heads while I just close in prayer. Lord, we thank you again for what was said. We thank you for your love and your mercies. We thank you for your blessings. God, you are worthy to be praised. You are worthy of praise. We pray, Lord Jesus, God, that you will bless your people, that you will help us to stand in this time when there are so much preachers and teachers God and, and persons who are saying that they are of Christ and they are not we pray oh God that you will help us as your people to to, to know truth to, to to be able to be attached to truth and to embrace truth we ask God that you guide us your people Lord Jesus Lord for every person that is tuning in that is not saved we ask, God, that you touch their hearts, that you bring them to repentance, and that you will save their souls. We ask, God, that for those who are saved, but, God, they are a bit wavering. They are not sure about certain things. We pray, God, that you will reveal yourself to them. Have it your way tonight as we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. By way of announcement, um, remember now, Last Sunday was group three and group four, and we had communion. Now it's time for group one and group two. So the service is going to be done similarly. We are going to ask the new converts, those who are 
eligible for the right hand of a fellowship again that they come out and that you know we introduce them to group one and to group two we're going to ask the leaders to come out as well you know because you know the, the, the new converts need to know and at the same time we greet you know the new converts on behalf of the entire body they know the restriction and all of that but god bless you again and we thank you for tuning in amen and amen <laughs>